There's a vast power vacuum in what is quickly becoming the failed state of Haiti. Can it be repaired? I'm Mercedes Stevenson. The West Block starts now. The fight to lead Haiti is now in the streets. With the president stepping down, it's feared one massive gang could soon be effectively running the country. What's Canada's role in efforts to help secure the island nation? We talk with Canada's ambassador on the ground in Port-au-Prince and Canada's ambassador to the United Nations. Violence and chaos like this aren't new for Haiti, but this time the situation is actually quite different, and it's worse. There's no longer a president after the interim leader was forced to resign after two years without elections and increasing gang violence. He had replaced the previous president, who was assassinated. What few military and police are left in the country have turned from trying to quell violence between rival gangs, some of which are as well armed as small militaries, to facing a new threat. Instead of fighting each other, the gangs have joined together, forming a criminal alliance that plans on being a dominant force in the country. The leader of the most powerful gang in the country, a man named Jimmy Barbecue Charouze, who used to be a police officer, had a warning for those who planned to intervene. Et communauté internationale, là, spécialement les États-Unis, le Canada, la France, corps groupe là, il y a responsable tout le monde qui a mouru dans le pays d'Haïti. The deteriorating security situation in the country's capital means many Haitians are facing famine while flights can't get in or out. And embassies, including Canada's, have evacuated much of their non-essential staff. Canada's ambassador to Haiti, André-François Giroux, however, is still in Port-au-Prince and he joins us now. Ambassador, welcome to the show. Thank you for making time for us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I imagine you are in the middle of, of what is an extraordinarily chaotic, violent, and dangerous situation on the ground. Can you describe to Canadians what is happening in Haiti right now and, and what it's like to be there? Well, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that Haiti has been facing these three crises in humanitarian, political and security for quite a few years now. Uh, when it comes to security, uh, so this has been ongoing, but the reality is what we've seen these past few weeks is, is, is the gang instead of just, you know, creating terror and pursuing their business model, which has been traditionally to kidnap people, to, to traffic drugs, and, and just, uh, you know, ask people for, for security, payment for security. What we've seen is them uh, working together, coordinating, and attacking, targeting some of the key infrastructure, the airport, the port, uh, police commissariat. As a response to all of this, the police has been doing a trem tremendous job and it is has regained some control over the port, is trying to rebuild a, a security parameter around the airport. But the re the reality is is the PNH is is not as, as strong as it should be. It needs to rebuild itself. That's why we, we've been investing in in, in, in in the PNH, assisting with them. But uh, you know, this is the reality on the ground right now, and, and um, obviously that creates a lot of uncertainty. And, and for that reason, uh, people are a little more nervous and, and, and need to be a, much more careful. It is a very different situation to be talking about dealing with criminal gangs who, who want to seize power. We're used to dealing sometimes with very violent governments uh, or extremists, but this is a, a bit of a unique situation. Can you explain to us who some of the key players are who are joining together to try to essentially, I don't know if I want to say seize power, I'm not sure they're looking to govern, but they're certainly looking to be the most powerful force in Haiti that are these extremely sophisticated gangs. Yes. Why? You, some people may ask, why do we see the gangs working together now and not, you know, six months ago? Because they, their modus operandi has been more or less fighting each other for to control respective territories. But the, the re, what Prime Minister, de facto Prime Minister Henri was trying to do was trying to create the conditions for a multinational security force to come. And that's not good news for the gangs, as you can imagine. So the gangs are very worried that, and then right now what we're seeing is, is they're trying to really um, uh, make make their territory even, even stronger and try to prevent this multinational force to come. 
very opportunistically, some uh, uh, political leaders have associated themselves with the gangs and are, for their own benefit, trying to mobilize the gangs and say, we're going to take power, we're going to create security because we have this alliance with, with the gangs. And then if you put us in power, we will run the country and, and, and restore security. The Asians people are not fools. They, they don't want a, a government, a country run by, by former criminals that are associated with gangs leader. And I think that most people would think that that certainly sounds like a better option. But how do you install that when you don't have quite literally the firepower necessarily to back that against gangs who in some cases have been assessed at having near peer combat capabilities to parts of the Canadian military? Yes, it, it, it is challenging, and, and we expect that as this um, government of national unity uh, forms itself, the gangs will do everything to make it uh, fail and, and create insecurity to prevent the, na the multinational security force to come. The, the government that we Asians are trying to put together will have a key two two main mandate, which will be to to create a, a clear path towards elections and welcome the multinational security force. So yes, the gang will continue to create insecurity. The police is doing again a tremendous job, um, uh, but it needs reinforcement, and that's why that multinational mission uh, needs to come uh, as soon as possible. We Canada over the um, the past year, year and a half, we've identified this as a critical uh, issue and that that's why Prime Minister Trudeau a year ago announced $100 million just dedicated to support the national police uh, in equipment, training, technical expertise. In addition to that $100 million, we've also mobilized the international community. Canada has supported Haiti verbally, but when it's come down to it, uh, when President Biden wanted Canada to lead the multinational force in Haiti, we declined. There has been deep concern from the leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces and of the RCMP that the risk was simply too high. The, the ha Haitian police who were training were not even going to Haiti to train them, were pulling them out to train them in a third party country because the risk was associated as being so high. So it, it seems like Canada is saying all the right things, but it seems like when there's a risk to take on, to actually get involved, there's hesitancy there. Do you think that's true? No, I, I think we we have to be realistic about our, our own capacity uh, and, and what we are doing is really uh, playing on our strength, uh, being uh, providing something that is definitely needed. Uh, training in a third country or training in AT. I think what what's the most important here is is that the training goes on, and then there's merit to do it in a third uh, location, so that uh, you know trainees can really focus on their training. I can assure you that when the conditions are there. We will be training in, uh, in doing training in Port-au-Prince as well. But right now, that was that was deemed to be more, more um, uh, opportunistic, I guess, or more uh, logistical. But uh, all to say that, uh, you know, we are definitely uh, using our, our own capacity and, and expertise to really support where we can make a difference. I know that uh, a number of your staff have been pulled out because of concerns about security. You have bravely stayed behind to try to assist Canadian citizens. Do you believe that you are going to be able to stay in the embassy or, or do you think it's likely that you're going to have to evacuate essential, essential staff um, out of Haiti completely? You know, we, we have to be ready for every eventuality, but uh, the last thing we want to do is is close our embassy and, and leave. Are you living in the embassy compound right now to, to be able to stay safe? I'm noticing the shutters closed behind you, and I'm sure there's a number of security precautions you have to take. I won't disclose my location, but I I, I, I can assure you that I'm I'm well equipped. Uh, I have uh, uh, water, food, uh, and good security, so I'm not worried for my own personal safety. I mean, we have to be careful. We we uh, reduce our movements on the ground as much as we can, uh, but we are very much here, operational, and and we're carrying on uh, with the work that we have to do.
Uh, Ambassador, the United States obviously has considerable military strength in the region, both in terms of ability to intervene, respond, and potentially rescue their embassy staff. Canada does not have that same strength. Would you like to see military assets from the Canadian Armed Forces in the region or special forces deployed to the embassy to help to protect you? As I, I had a chance to explain before, we are making every contingency plan, and and I take great uh, comfort knowing that the U.S. is is well tooled here as well, and is a good ally, and and Miami is not too far. But I would say for the time being, uh, we're we're definitely ready for every uh, every uh, uh, opportunity or every um, occasion, and and we are, uh, as you can imagine, coordinating very closely with all of our good allies in the region. What advice do you have for Canadians who are in Haiti right now? I know they've been told to shelter in place, but obviously this is an extremely dangerous and, and stressful situation. Is the government of Canada able to offer them anything more than that? Uh, well, right now, uh, and then please keep in mind that our travel advisory for the last year and a half has been uh, don't come to IT. If you are in IT, uh, it's time to leave and, and go back home. So the people, the Canadians that are here are are here because they know the lay of the land. They, they know what to expect. So, uh, and I know they're very resilient. Our advice is shelter in place. Uh, make sure that you have reserve of water, food, medicine, like I do. Uh, and don't uh, don't uh, move around unless you really have to. Certainly our wish for you too. We know events don't always comply with that, but we thank you for joining us and we wish you the very best. Please stay safe and we appreciate your service. Thank you very much. And for a view from home, here's a quick listen of how some Haitian Canadians are feeling about the crisis. I mean, in the past month, I've had uh, members of the family have been kidnapped so that's been an ongoing uh, a situation now for the past, I guess, seven, eight years. Every day, there's somebody's going to die or somebody who won't have food to eat because they cannot walk. They cannot go to work. Their work probably have been burned out or their, their house have been burned. We really don't know what to tell them. You know, they're crying, <laughs> really crying on the phone, saying, get me out of there. As the situation on the ground deteriorates, up next, we talk about the options to get help into Haiti. Proud to celebrate 50 years covering our communities. Global News, we believe in a greater Toronto. There have been many efforts to help Haiti in the past, but most have not gone well. In 2004, the UN force Minista was established and quickly known for rapes and extrajudicial killings. In 2005, a massacre of Haitians by Brazilian soldiers working for the UN. And in 2010, Haiti's first cases of cholera killed at least 10,000 after UN peacekeepers arrived from Nepal, where the disease is common. And there are many more examples. So how can the UN help this time without repeating history's mistakes? Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, joins us now. Ambassador, nice to see you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again, too, Mercedes. Good to be with you. Uh, ambassador Ray, what is the situation in terms of trying to secure the situation on the ground in Haiti and, and this external force that is still supposed to be coming in? Is, is that possible? Yes, it's possible. The security situation is bad, uh, but it's 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 it can be remedied, and I I personally know that the the Haitian National Police have been responding in a in a remarkable way to protecting state institutions, to pushing back against the gangs, but they simply don't have enough uh, equipment, enough enough ability to kind of get at it uh, in in the major way that's required, and that's why we believe the United Nations agrees that we need a multinational force which will which will begin to address the, the the serious deficit that the Haitian National Police faces at the present time but it can be done it it absolutely can be done we just have to get the political will the financial will uh, and all the other things that are required to get it done and Canada is very committed to being part of that solution ambassador ray one of the reasons i always enjoy speaking with you is because you say things like they are and, and you're not afraid to really sort of speak truth to power. 
It strikes me when we look at Haiti, this is a country that has been through terrible devastation, terrible poverty, terrible violence. It is in our hemisphere, but we don't talk about it very much. We talk about supporting the government, but Canada doesn't want to lead the international mission. We don't actually want to put RCMP or military on the ground, in part because there'd be such a danger to our troops. But that leads me to, well, we've allowed it to get that out of control. Why do you think that Haiti has been largely abandoned by the international community and by North America when it comes to making a serious effort at getting this country rebuilt and their security under control? Do people just not care? No, actually, I don't think it's about not caring. I think it's about struggling to find a way of supporting the people of Haiti uh, without supporting actors which, frankly, are corrupt and, and not helping the situation. And I think the challenge has always been that, you know, we come in with massive amounts of money. If you look at what happened after 2010 and the experience after 2010, we came in with a lot of money, money spilled all over the place. Money was taken over by, you know, some of the ruling families of the country and immediately extorted, went out to Miami or New York or Montreal or somewhere else. And it wasn't used for the benefit of the Haitian people. And I think we've got to avoid that kind of a production at all costs. The other thing is, is this is urban, this is urban fighting. This is a dealing with urban gangs. And we have to be quite specific and uh, careful about making sure that we do everything possible to extract the kids out of the gangs. And there are countries that are going to be involved in doing this, helping make this happen. But I would like to kind of talk back a little bit to, uh, against your narrative on, on abandonment. Nobody's abandoned Haiti. Haiti has received um, billions, tens of billions of dollars from, from countries in the last 25, 30 years, received a lot of money. And not all that money has been put to good use. And, and I think we'd be deluding ourselves if we thought that wasn't a problem. So we have to strengthen Haiti's institutions. We have to require accountability. We have to make sure money is going to where it's needed, how it's needed. And we have to make sure that it's not just piled all, piled on all of a sudden, because we've got to deal with the long-term development needs of the country with an effective a plan that's really going to work. And we are dealing with an unprecedented network of gangsters who are violent, um, who are very well entrenched, who are well armed uh, and well equipped. And it's going to be a very tough struggle to, to, uh, to bring them down. So how do you operate in that environment then? If you're dealing with these gangsters who there's obviously questionable morality about engaging with them, but they're the guys who seem to have the power right now. You have a government uh, in name that's trying to form, but doesn't have an ability to execute and a long history of rich politicians sucking money out of the country and redirecting it to their homes in Miami. Uh, how do you come into that and, and find a solution that isn't just the international community taking over and running things for a while? Or is, is that something we should be looking at like post-World War II in Japan? No. No, I don't think taking over. We've tried that before. I mean, frankly, Mercedes, that's the model that we that we followed. We fell into without really thinking about it. And we can't do that again. That, that's a mistake. Uh, we have to let the Haitian political institutions do the job. We need more cooperation. And one thing we do need, and I have to say this uh, very deliberately, is we need greater effort from the Americans on the export of arms from their country to Haiti. We have to understand that the largest source of guns in Haiti and frankly in the Caribbean is the United States of America. And we've talked to the Americans about this. I've been very open in talking to, to people about it. And uh, there has to be an effort to, by the United States to reduce, to reduce the export of arms. The, the, United, the United Nations uh, resolution talked about that very directly. And the, the statement that was made by the Security Council last week talked very directly about the importance of an arms embargo and which means that countries like Canada and the United States and the EU and others that have the means to actually enforce an embargo need to enforce the embargo. What is the consequence regionally and for Canada if we fail in Haiti? Well, I mean, the way I put it is this, is there are two issues for me. The first one is that the, sec the, the security of any country is, is only as strong as the weakest link. And the security of any region is only as strong as the weakest link. We have issues of crime in the Caribbean. We have issues of insecurity. We have um, questions about you know, how do we build stronger economies, more resilient of e economies. Um, and we need to understand that when things really collapse in Haiti, it has a, 
a devastating impact on the region. There's also, I think, a need to recognize that uh, we, we have a neighbor who's taken some very hard hits uh, and the people are suffering badly and they, they, they're hurting. And so when people are hurting and are suffering, we have a responsibility to respond and to be helpful. But we also have a responsibility to do it right and to do it in a way that works for, for them and also works for, for, for us, works for everybody. We, we know it's not going to be easy, but we are definitely not walking away from this situation. Canada has stepped up in a number of ways and we're going to continue to do it. And uh, frankly, I'm very proud of the fact that, that over many decades we, uh, we have helped. Ambassador Ray, thank you so much for joining us today, sir. We appreciate it. Good to be with you. Take care. Up next, preparing for a showdown over the planned carbon tax hike. Now for one last thing. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will have to spend a fair chunk of this coming week defending the planned increase to his signature carbon tax, which is scheduled to kick in on April 1st. Multiple Conservative premiers from Alberta's Danielle Smith to Ontario's Doug Ford have called for a pause. If they don't start uh, you know, putting money back into people's pockets instead of filling their pockets, guess what? Uh, they're... they're uh, they're going to get annihilated, as I said before. They're done. <laughs> done like dinner. Some of Mr. Trudeau's political allies, though, are supporting what those Conservative premiers are saying, including Newfoundland and Labrador's Liberal Premier Anthony Fury. He's encouraging the government to rethink the hike. So far, the pleas are falling on deaf ears. Justin Trudeau has been categoric that there is no plan to slow down or stop. And he says that those who are asking for such a thing are putting popularity over policy. But my job is not to be popular. My job, although it helps, uh, my job, <laughs> my job is to do the right things for Canada now and do the right things for Canadians a generation from now. And that's what I've been focused on. And yeah, it's not always popular. But I know that doing the right things today that support people today that deliver that better future a generation from now, two generations from now, is going to make a huge difference in the path we take forward. But as April 1st draws closer and Canadians struggle with the cost of living, the tax increase is an easy target for the federal Conservatives, who have a series of political shenanigans planned in the House of Commons to embarrass the Liberals over the increase and are holding rallies across the country. Tax the tax! Mr. Trudeau's justifications and explanations ranging from principled environmentalism to the argument that the rebate puts money back in the pockets of Canadians have failed to convince people that this is a good idea. So will Mr. Trudeau revisit his insistence that the hike has to go ahead? Well, that might in part depend on whether he's starting to think about his legacy as Prime Minister versus his chances of re-election. Thanks for joining us so much this week and we'll see you right back here next Sunday.